So, uh, welcome again to lectures on advanced complex analysis. Uh, so, what we are going to do uh, today is ask a very basic question, okay. So, let me switch to the uh, uh, writing board. So, suppose, uh, suppose uh, f from uh, d to c uh, is an analytic function. Of course, uh, analytic means uh, the same as holomorphic, okay. So, uh, so analytic uh, is the same as holomorphic and always uh, as usual we assume D uh, is a domain in the complex plane, okay. So, uh, D uh, domain uh, in the complex plane. So, that means that uh, uh, D is a subset of the complex plane, uh, D is uh, uh, open, uh, D is connected and of course, uh, you know D is certainly non-empty, I mean uh, because by definition, uh, you know the empty set is uh, also open, okay. So, of course, we are not interested in looking at uh, in the empty set. So, D is connected and of course, you know in this uh, context that uh, for an open set uh, connectedness is equivalent to path connectedness. So, D is also path connected, okay. So, so, so you have a function f, f is analytic, uh, f is a, a function which is a, a complex valued function. Uh, it is a complex valued function of one complex variable and that one complex variable you might call it as z. So, you can uh, think of the function as f of z and z varies over d, okay. And what is, a, what is the fundamental question that we are asking? The fundamental question that we are asking is uh, what is the image of f, okay. So, that is the question. So, so here is my, here is the, uh, uh, so, so let me, uh, so let me change color. Um, to something else, uh, so, so, so here is a question. Uh, what is the image of f? So this is the question. So in other words, uh, so that is, so you take, you look at f of d, okay. What is f of d? It's a set of values of f, okay. So this is equal to the set of all f of z where z varies in d, okay. This is the set of values of f uh, this is all the values that f takes on d, okay. And obviously it takes complex values, so f of d is a subset of the complex plane and the question is what kind of a subset is it, is this, okay. So, uh, 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 yeah. So, what is the image of f? That is, uh, uh, that is, uh, if f of d is equal to this, uh, then uh, what is the nature? What is the nature of f of d? So, uh, so when I say what is the nature of f of d, you know, you ask, uh, uh, what do you mean by nature? Okay. By Nature of course, one, one can ask a couple of things, one is of course topological nature, okay. So, f of d is a subset of the complex plane and you know a complex plane is a topological space. So, you can ask whether f of d is open, uh, uh, whether f of d has any one of these properties that subsets of a topological space satisfy, okay. Uh, properties that you know are open sets, sets being open, sets being closed, uh, sets being connected, sets being path connected, sets being compact and so on. So, you can ask what is the nature of this set f of d uh, in the topological sense, okay. Then you can ask another question is how big is f of d, okay. What is this, uh, how much of it, uh, how big it is when compared to the whole complex plane, okay. So, so, so when I say nature, I can ask uh, topological and the other thing is how big, how big is it. So, uh, um, and it so happens that uh, complex analysis uh, uh, 
gives you uh, several nice theorems which answer go a long way in answering these questions okay uh, so let me so let me uh, uh, you know uh, let me go ahead and you know look at uh, just a minute let me resize the screen so that i get so so let me uh, look at the following let us ask some simple questions let us ask some simple questions. So, the, the, there are there are first uh, a few uh, obvious things that you can say see uh, f is an analytic function. Uh, so, you know analytic functions are in fact uh, uh, infinitely differentiable uh, that is what you learn in a first course in complex analysis once differentiability implies infinite differentiability on an open set and that is one of the characteristic properties of an analytic function and therefore in particular uh, they are certainly continuous and you know continuity uh, preserves certain properties for example the continuous image of a connected set is connected, continuous image of a uh, path connected set is path connected, the continuous image of a compact set is compact. So you can say immediately that f of d is certainly a connected set okay. So that is very very basic topology it just uses the fact that the continuous image of a connected set is connected. Okay. So, uh, uh, so let me say the following thing of course uh, uh, f is continuous uh, so you know I will use uh, some abbreviations CTS stands for continuous so f is continuous uh, so uh, f of d uh, is, uh, is connected this is of course very very basic but then we want to know more. Uh, so you know let us let us try to see uh, 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 let us ask a few questions. So for example uh, we ask a question like can f take values on a line or can f take all values only on a curve okay. So, so let us ask this question so, uh, so let me again change color uh, uh, can uh, f take values only on a curve of course by a curve I mean um, any simple curve that you can think of like a parabola or a circle or something like that uh, and in particular also it could uh, very well be a straight line which is also a curve okay. So can f take values on a curve so say for so for example you know uh, suppose I take uh, so example uh, so let me look at a few examples uh, can f take uh, values uh, on uh, uh, the real line uh, I mean take only values on the real line this means you are saying that the image of f uh, is a subset of the real line okay uh, and you know if see if f takes values only on the real line uh, this is equivalent to saying that the imaginary part of f is 0 okay because f, uh, it, f is a complex valued function normally we write f is equal to u plus iv where u is the real part of f and v is the imaginary part of f and you know very well from a first course in complex analysis that u and v have to uh, you know uh, be harmonic and in fact they will satisfy the Cauchy Riemann equations okay because f is analytic uh, but the point is that uh, if you say that f takes only values on the real line it means you are saying that v is always 0 that means the imaginary part of f is 0. So the, this this is equivalent to saying that you know uh, imaginary part of f is 0 okay and uh, you know I can also ask can f take uh, only values on the imaginary uh, axis. Uh, Okay, that is the y axis considered as the imaginary axis on the complex plane okay and the, the, the that is equal to saying that the real part of f is 0 okay. So this is another uh, case of uh, f taking values only on a line uh, then of course I can ask can f take values on a circle okay so let me ask that also can uh, f take uh, only values on a circle uh, so you know if you think that the circle is centered at the point w0 and has radius r0 
this is equivalent to saying that modulus of f of modulus of f minus w naught is equal to r naught this is what it means this is this is the condition that f takes values on a circle okay. Now uh, surprisingly um, uh, not surprisingly in fact this is something that you should have seen uh, if you just recall that these are all the conditions that will uh, ensure that the derivative of f vanishes and therefore f has to be a constant okay. So if the imaginary part of f is 0 that is the same as saying that the imaginary part is a constant okay uh, it is a special case of the fact that the imaginary part is a constant and in the uh, and if the constant is 0 this is equal to saying uh, that that amounts to saying that the imaginary part of f is 0 which means it takes only real values and uh, if the real part of f is 0 that is a special case of the real part being constant okay and uh, and the f taking values on a circle is the same as saying that the function f minus w naught which is f added to minus w naught which is a constant function okay uh, that has constant modulus that modulus is r naught okay. Now uh, you would have done this in a first course in complex analysis probably by using the Cauchy Riemann equations that you know if uh, uh, the function has uh, imaginary part constant or the real part constant or modulus constant then the function has to be constant okay. So all these things can happen only if f is constant okay. So uh, all these all these can happen only when uh, f is a constant f is a constant function okay it takes the same value. So so the of course therefore, therefore the question is we are not certainly we are not interested in studying constant functions because there is nothing special about these constant functions the a constant function maps the whole plane onto a single point which is the value of the function that constant we are not interested in. So uh, we are not interested in such constant functions we are, we are worried about non constant functions okay. So what this will tell you immediately is that if you have a non constant analytic function okay uh, it cannot take values uh, uh, at least on a uh, on a line or something like a circle okay. But then uh, so what is it uh, so, so what this tells you is that the uh, either you have the case that you are looking at a constant function in which case the image is single point okay it is that single constant value that it takes or uh, the image cannot uh, be a subset of just the real line or it cannot be a subset of only the imaginary axis it cannot be a subset of the circle that such a thing such things cannot happen that is what this says okay. But what is it that you have more generally so more generally we have uh, you know uh, uh, we have a very nice theorem so here is a theorem so here is a theorem and uh, it is called the open mapping theorem. and uh, it is a very very fundamental theorem uh, what it says is that uh, uh, a non constant analytic map is always an open map okay. So uh, uh, if f from d to c is a non constant analytic map uh, then f is an open map okay it is an open map. So, so let us try to understand what this means it means that see what is an open map an open map is a map which uh, which uh, for which the image of any open set is again an open set okay. So in particular what this will tell you is that f of d is an open set because d is already a domain the d is a domain so d is already an open connected set so f of d will become open okay and uh, it is already connected so it is the same as it being path connected so f of d is again a domain okay so so what this so what is a, so let us try to understand what this means f of d is open so it is a domain so that is uh, that is something that comes immediately okay. And mind you f is not a constant function so it takes more than one value so f of d is non empty of course okay. And uh, uh, then the, the the other important thing is the following thing what is this condition of uh, uh, open uh, mapping 
if you take u a subset of d which is an open subset then f of u will also continue to be open okay. So if u is a subset of d is uh, open then f of u is open this is what an open map means it maps open sets to open sets the image of an open set under an open map is again an open set that is the definition of what an open map is okay and uh, 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 so so let us let us go a little bit more into this and uh, you know try to see what it really means what is a, what is the meaning of an open set an open set is a set for which every point is an interior point okay that means you take any point in the open set then there is a small disk open disk surrounding that point which is also in that set that is what an interior point means okay. So, so what does f being open mean suppose f takes a certain value w uh, let us say it takes a value w0 okay then there is a uh, that means you are saying w0 belongs to the image of f okay if f takes the value w0 okay that means w0 is in the image of f because image of f just consists of the values of f okay and then but since the image of f is open w0 is a point of an open set therefore there is a small open disk centered at w0 which is also in the image. So it means that if f takes a certain value it will take all values in a small disk surrounding that value okay. So this should immediately tell you that f cannot simply take values on a curve because the moment f takes values at a point it will take all values in a small disk surrounding that point and you know no curve can accommodate a small disk however small okay therefore you immediately get this idea that you know uh, the uh, the image of an analytic mapping non constant analytic mapping cannot go into a curve we saw special cases we saw that it cannot go on into the real axis it cannot go into the imaginary axis it cannot be a circle okay it cannot go into the circle but it is more general the reason is uh, the image uh, is open okay and of course curves are closed sets okay. So, so let me write that down uh, uh, if uh, uh, w0 uh, is equal to f of z0 uh, for uh, z0 in D that is this is the same as saying that w0 is in image of f which is f of d then uh, f of d being open implies that there exists a small open disk uh, in f of d containing w0 and that implies that f takes all values in a small disk centered uh, at z at, at w naught. So this is what is very very important if f takes a certain value it will take all values in a disk about that value okay this is a, this is a very very important property and this is true for of course for a non constant analytic function okay fine. So, um, so this is about uh, this is about uh, um, at the moment this is about the uh, uh, topological property of f of d okay this theorem tells you that f of d the image of f is certainly a, a, a domain it is an open connected set it is very very important that it is an open set and in fact uh, uh, going uh, into a higher geometric point of view okay uh, what actually happens is this so let me tell it to you in words what actually happens is that the mapping f from d to f of d becomes what is called a ramified cover of Riemann surfaces okay. So it means that it there are set of points uh, uh, these are the points where the derivative of f vanishes okay these are called the points of ramification and outside those points in the complement of those points this is actually a covering map ok 
okay. It is a covering map in the topological sense and also in the analytic or holomorphic sense, okay. So, uh, uh, this open mapping theorem is so important that you know it tells you that uh, essentially every analytic non constant analytic mapping is a ramified cover, okay. Fine. So, now what I am going to do is I am going to go to ask uh, uh, a more specific question. So, we are trying to look at the image of uh, uh, a domain under an analytic function. So, let us look at the cases where first at the case where you know the, uh, the function is analytic on the whole plane. So, th these are the entire functions. So, what is an entire function? An entire function is a complex valued function which is analytic on the whole plane, okay. And then the question is what is the uh, uh, what is the image of uh, such a function? So, uh, there is a very uh, deep theorem. Uh, namely it is the uh, so called uh, little Picard theorem which says that the image is either the whole complex plane or it is the punctured plane, it is a punctured plane namely it is a complex plane minus a single point. That means an entire function okay will take all values except for uh, omitting at most one value okay and this is called the little Picard theorem okay. So, let me state that. Uh, So, here is a little Picard theorem uh, sometimes people also use the adjective small Picard theorem. Uh, so, what is this? Uh, uh, if uh, f from uh, C to C is analytic uh, that is so let me write it here f is entire uh, then either f of C is equal to C okay or f of C is equal to C minus uh, w naught for some w naught in C. So, this is a little Picard theorem. So, you know it is a it is a very tremendous theorem it says that you take an entire function you take the image the image is huge I mean the image is literally everything at the worst if the image uh, omits it can omit only one value okay. And the case where uh, the image omits a single value is of course, the, the simplest example is that of the exponential function. You know if you take the function z going to e power z then that is an entire function okay. And the image uh, will not uh, it will be the whole punctured it will be the punctured plane it will be the complex plane minus the origin because the exponential function will never take the value 0 because 0 does not have a logarithm okay. So, uh, 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 if you take any non-zero complex number you can find a logarithm and the exponential of that logarithm will give, give you back that complex number. Of course, you will get many logarithms okay, but uh, you can find at least one for a non-zero complex number. So, it means that the exponential function will take all values except 0 okay and that is the uh, so in that case uh, uh, it is a it is an example that illustrates Picard's theorem. Uh, if you take f of z equal to e power z then the image of f is actually c minus 0 which is a punctured plane. Normally if you take the whole complex plane and remove a single point that is called a punctured plane okay uh, with puncture at that point because that point has been removed okay. And of course, there is also the case when uh, a function uh, an entire function can take all values the simplest case is that of a polynomial. So, if you take a polynomial uh, uh, if I if I take f of z equal to p of z where p of z is a polynomial then uh, uh, it will take all values because I can always solve for p of z equal to w naught for any w naught and that is because of the uh, fundamental theorem of algebra uh, namely that the complex numbers are algebraically closed. So, I can always solve a polynomial equation in one variable okay. So, a polynomial is also an entire function and it is it gives the case uh, the first case uh, 
namely the image of the whole complex plane is the whole complex plane okay. Fine so this is the little Picard theorem. Now the somehow uh, what I want to do is I want to really uh, uh, try to prove this okay it is a deep theorem normally this theorem is only stated in a first course in complex analysis but since this is an advanced course in complex analysis uh, I, I think it is fitting to look at a proof of this. Now well you know uh, interestingly uh, it is it is very interesting that uh, the proof of this that I am going to present is actually uh, uh, gotten by deriving this as a corollary to a much more uh, uh, deeper theorem which is called the big Picard theorem. And the funny thing is that the big Picard theorem is a theorem uh, which deals which again asks the same kind of question it, uh, it answers the same it, it uh, answers the same kind of question namely what is the image of a domain under an analytic map okay. But the point is that the domain you are looking at is uh, a disk around an essential singularity of an analytic function okay. So you know uh, so let me state that so uh, so here is uh, uh, so let me use something else uh, uh, this will be deduced from the uh, from the big or great Picard theorem and that is uh, let uh, so here is a statement of the theorem let z0 be an isolated essential singularity of an analytic function f okay then uh, f of uh, so i am so let me write this 0 less than mod z minus z not less than epsilon uh, is equal to c or c minus a single value uh, for every uh, epsilon greater than 0 uh, in in the domain uh, of analyticity of f okay so uh, so I'm, I've just stated a part of the theorem. There's still more to it. So, uh, so, so I want you to uh, look at this. It's see what I want you to appreciate is I want you to appreciate the following thing. Uh, to deduce the little Picard theorem, the, which is a theorem about a, a function which is analytic on the whole plane. If a function is, uh, mind you, if a function is analytic on the whole plane, it has no singularities. Okay, it has no singular points. Okay, so. The little Picard theorem is a theorem about a function which has no singular points, okay, and it says that the image of uh, the whole plane under such a function is either the whole plane or a punctured plane, okay. But we are deducing it from a theorem about the image of a function with a singularity. So that's the funny thing, okay. So you, so it, it's like you know even to answer a question about an entire function, you are forced to study singularities. This is the point I want you to understand. Okay, see, normally we would not like to uh, uh, dirty our hands with singularities. Why study singularities when there are functions without singularities? But the point is, you know, sometimes uh, mathematics and theory teaches us that even to study good things, you have to study bad things. Okay, so so if you want to prove the little Picard theorem is a theorem about good things, uh, I mean, a function is analytic uh, entire. You have to still study uh, functions which are uh, having singularities. Okay, and so. So here is a gray, the big Picard theorem, and obviously you know the adjective great or big should tell you that this, uh, the big, uh, the, this thick, this big Picard theorem has to be a big brother of the little Picard theorem, and therefore you know the little Picard theorem can be deduced from uh, the support of the big brother, 
okay. And what is this, what is this big Picard theorem, what does it say? See you are looking at a uh, an analytic function, okay and you are looking at a singularity of an analytic function, okay. Now uh, so I will I will come uh, 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 later to uh, what a singularity is, okay. Uh, because uh, that is motivation for me to recall these things, okay. So you look at a function f which at a point has uh, isolated singularity, okay. Isolated means there is a whole disk surrounding that point where there are no other singularities, okay. And uh, a deleted uh, disk surrounding that point is given in this form uh, as I as I sh as I written here in the uh, on my uh, board. Uh, 0 strictly less than mod z minus z naught strictly less than epsilon is actually the disk uh, centered at z naught radius epsilon it is an open disk but I have thrown out z naught that is the reason for putting 0 strictly less than I am not allowing z equal to z naught that means I have it is a punctured disk okay it is a punctured disk cent, uh, uh, centered at z naught and the puncture is exactly at z naught I have thrown out z naught okay and on this disk the uh, I am assuming that this disk is uh, full of points where function is analytic okay and that will be true uh, at for at least for small values of epsilon greater than 0 because the point z0 is an isolated singularity okay and look at what the theorem says it says you take the image of this when I write f of something okay it means f of uh, this set which is the punctured disk that is the whole complex plane or it is a complex plane minus a single point and uh, this is true for uh, uh, epsilon sufficiently small and therefore it will be true for uh, even larger epsilon so long as this deleted disk is in the domain of analyticity of f because larger disks larger deleted disks will contain smaller deleted disks and therefore their images will contain images of smaller deleted disks okay. So, uh, so you see this is again uh, you see the, the result of the, uh, uh, the, the, the conclusions of the theorem uh, the both the big Picard theorem and the little Picard theorem they are the same I mean the conclusion always says that the image under an analytic function of a certain domain okay is either the whole complex plane or it is the complex plane minus a point okay and in the case of the little Picard theorem you are looking at the domain is the whole complex plane. But in the case of the great Picard theorem the domain is a very small uh, neighbourhood uh, deleted neighbourhood of an essential singularity of an analytic function and what is really amazing is in fact there is more to this Picard theorem what it says is you see so I what I want you to observe is the following thing uh, it is it is a very very uh, it is a very very deep result it says take a very small neighbourhood of the essential singularity okay deleted neighbourhood that means of course you do not take the neighbourhood that you take should be uh, a domain where the function is analytic so it cannot include the singularity. So when I say take a neighbourhood of an essential singularity of course I mean delete that essential singularity so you are taking a deleted neighbourhood of the essential singularity and mind you you take a neighbourhood as small as I want you see this epsilon can be extremely small okay and the theorem is amazing it says you take no matter how small a neighbourhood you take the image of that neighbourhood is still the whole plane no matter how small your neighbourhood is the image of that very small neighbourhood no matter how small is still the whole plane it still takes all those values. So what this tells you is you know it tells you that uh, it tells you how uh, uh, how the values of the analytic function change in a neighbourhood of an essential singularity in a neighbourhood of an essential singularity this analytic function uh, is taking all values at the worst it can it can omit one value okay and uh, uh, of course you know the uh, the example for this is uh, just as in the case of the uh, little Picard theorem where you where the example of an entire function omitting a value is exponential e power z okay which omits the value 0 here you can take e power 1 by z okay you can take the function e power 1 by z and this e power 1 by z and e power 1 by z at z equal to 0 has an essential singularity and if you take any small deleted neighbourhood of 0 however small and you take the image under e power 1 by z you will get the whole plane except the origin because exponential function will never take the value 0 
So, you know it is an amazing, it is an amazing result, it is an amazing result and in fact uh, there is a stronger version of the Picard theorem which says that uh, not only uh, does the image of any small neighbourhood uh, however small uh, of uh, an essential singularity under uh, 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 under an analytic function uh, is the whole plane or plane minus point it says it takes the every com uh, complex value that it takes it takes infinitely many times so so it's uh, so there is in fact uh, so let me write that down uh, just to tell you how powerful the theorem is uh, uh, so let so let me write that uh, uh, for every epsilon greater than 0 such that 0 less than mod z minus z naught less than epsilon is in the domain of analyticity of f uh, f assumes each complex value with at most one exception w naught infinitely many times. So, in fact this 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 infinitely many times part of it which tells you the uh, uh, more uh, I mean it tells you with a uh, lot of force what is happening. So, the 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 first part of the great Picard theorem says that you take take an essential singularity and take a very small deleted neighbourhood about that take a very small disc surrounding the essential singularity and take its image under the analytic function. Of course, uh, you do you do not take uh, the, the analytic function is not defined at a singularity ok. So, you do not take the value at the singularity there is no such thing. So, you are actually taking the image of a deleted neighbourhood, but the point is no matter how small the deleted neighbourhood is your image will be the whole complex plane or it may be complex plane minus a single point that is the first part of the theorem and in fact what this part of the theorem says is that you know you take any value any of the values in the complex plane except possibly for that one value w naught which it will not take ok. Take that take any other uh, of the values that it takes that value itself if you take the pre image of that value in that neighbourhood the pre image is an infinite set ok. That means there are infinitely many points even in that small neighbourhood there are infinitely many points at which the function takes that prescribed that value that you, you that you are pointing at. And this happens for every value that it takes. So, it what it does is it is very funny it looks as if you take a very small neighbourhood uh, around the essential singularity the function not only maps that very small neighbourhood onto the whole plane or whole plane minus a point, but it maps it infinitely many times ok. It is like it maps it thousands and thousands of times ok and that is an amazing thing. It is not that uh, uh, for every complex value there is one value here which goes to that. The fact is you take any complex value other than the exceptional value w naught then there are infinitely many uh, points in this very small disk however small where that value is taken by f ok. So, that small neighbourhood uh, it is really amazing to think of it you think, think of a very small infinitesimally small neighbourhood which is being again and again you know uh, it mapped thousands of times I mean probably uncountably many number of times uh, onto the uh, whole plane or the whole plane minus a point that is how the function behaves uh, in a neighbourhood of an essential singularity. And this is the key to uh, the uh, this this theorem on singularities is the key to uh, proving or deducing as a corollary the little Picard theorem ok. So, uh, we will try to uh, in the forthcoming lectures we will try to uh, 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 give a proof of this theorem ok. And uh, so, I will tell you roughly I will give you uh, an idea of where we are going to go. 
So you know first of all I want to recall something about singularities, some you would have studied singularities but I would like to recall them and uh, uh, some basic theorems about singularities especially the Riemann's theorem on removable singularities and then I want to uh, deduce from that what is called the uh, a weak version of the big Picard theorem which is called the Cassorati weierstrass theorem and the Cassorati weierstrass theorem is slightly weaker what it says is that uh, uh, while the uh, big Picard theorem says that uh, a function assumes uh, an analytic function assumes all values except with possibly one exception in every neighbourhood of an essential singularity what the Cassorati weierstrass theorem says is that it says it will come arbitrarily close to every value okay. So the Cassorati weierstrass theorem is a slightly uh, weaker version of the uh, uh, great Picard theorem and that can be more or less deduced using uh, the uh, Riemann's theorem on removable singularities which I will prove okay I will state and prove okay so I will have to recall something about singularities but then as we move towards the proof of the big Picard theorem what you will have to do is that we will have to study not one function but you will have to study a space of functions and we uh, have to study functions with singularities and uh, the kind of functions we are going to study are functions with singularities as poles and these are called meromorphic functions. So what I am going to do is I am going to study topology of a space of meromorphic functions and prove some fundamental theorems like Montel's theorem okay and these are the keys to uh, unlocking the proof of uh, the big Picard theorem okay. So uh, the so what I am going to do in the next few lectures is first recall singularities uh, then uh, tell you something about uh, uh, Riemann's removable singularity theorem, prove the Cassorati weierstrass theorem and then go on to meromorphic functions, studying meromorphic functions and then trying to study families of meromorphic functions topologically uh, uh, whether that space is compact and things like that okay. So that is the uh, that is the direction in which we will be proceeding. So the, the uh, at least the first part of the these, uh, these lectures our aim is to prove the great Picard theorem and you will see on the way we will prove several other important theorems.